Good morning, church. You were all really quiet this morning. I was like, I better start. They're ready. My name is Nathan. Uh, I'm an associate pastor here at the church, and it's my privilege to welcome you to Grace Point Fellowship. I've probably said it three or four times already today that it's a privilege to be here together. It really is a privilege to come and worship our Lord together, open up his word, and this morning we get to celebrate communion together. It's a I'm excited. I'm excited about what God has for us, and I'm excited about you being here. If this is your very first time, you picked a great day to come and be a part of what we are doing here this morning. If you are, for the first time, having come down this road and opened these doors, I really do hope that you feel welcome, and I'm not the first person to welcome you. I love our church family. We are a warm family. But if this is your first time, please, in your bulletin, would you let us know that so that we can personally contact you as a staff and just answer any questions you might have? Uh, that's our goal, is just to help you find the church the Lord wants you to be at. Uh, whether it's here or another local church, we want you to plug in. Also, for those of you who have been here for many, many Sundays, would you please fill out those prayer requests uh, in your bulletin? Uh, would you make them big and clear? And uh, we will be praying over requests this morning. It might be a little bit different, uh, we, depending on how much we uh, have as far as um, praying over all of them or not. But we still want to know your prayer requests so we can pray for them as a staff. We would love to have those prayer requests turned in for the week. And then uh, right now we have some family things coming up this week that I want to share with you. As always, the best place to find out about our church is in our bulletin and on our website. Our website has all the calendaring uh, things for the summer and dates and events. It's a great place to go. Also at the welcome desk, we want you to know what's happening. We want you to be involved. So uh, go to your bulletin for anything that we might skip over. So one of the first things is this week we have uh, something that's become just an awesome thing at our church is the men's game night. It's right here at this building. It's free food, but please do sign up so that we know you're coming. Uh, we're, I think we're having uh, spaghetti this week. Yeah, spaghetti. We're having spaghetti. Deluxe spaghetti. Deluxe. You make up whatever that means, but it's going to be great. All right, so we're going to have spaghetti, uh, but we're going to have a really good time uh, together as men sharing a testimony and just getting to know one another. Also coming up very quickly is Easter. That's next Sunday. Time is flying. We have two services that we are inviting our community and you to come. Please invite your neighbors. Uh, there are people that would want to go, but no one's invited them. So if some, somebody is put onto your heart, don't ignore it. Just ask, Lord, is there somebody you want me to invite? And if he puts it on your heart, don't ignore it. Uh, we'll have two services. Please bring flowers to help uh, flower the cross. We'll be doing that at each service, so please bring flowers. Also, um, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt for all the children, and it's going to be at 10 o'clock. So in between the two services, we're going to be over here in the children's area, and we're going to do an Easter egg hunt. Really fun. So we want you to be able to make that uh, at 10 o'clock. So otherwise, we just hope that you, you come on to either of those services and invite your friends to come hear about what Jesus has done in our life. Uh, we also have the blood drive coming up. In two weeks, we need 19 more people to sign up, so we fill up slots. So we are getting more people signing up, but we still have 19 slots for those who can give blood on that morning. So would you please use your bulletin uh, to sign up for a time slot if you're physically able. We would love to fill up that bus. So when they come, they just like, man, we used every spot, and we're really blessing our community in that way. Uh, finally, I think we have our work day at the end of the month. So just pencil this in, the work day at the end of the month, April 30th. Here we start at the church, and we're going to have projects here at the church, but also in the community. So we hope to go out and help some of our own church members, uh, some of our own senior citizens who need help in the yard work, uh, wheelchair ramps, things like that. So if you know of somebody in our church that needs help, please let us know. Please make us aware so we can do these types of things on our work day. So uh, just put that in your calendar, and we'll give you more information as we go. So uh, with that, I'm going to invite Brother Gary to come up and give our call to worship. Good morning, church. I'm glad to see you here. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, the reason we're here is because of you. Amen? We know that the reason that we have life is because of your breath. We know that the only reason that we have to celebrate is because of your son. This morning, Lord, would you help our attention to be on Christ Jesus, your son. Thank you, God, for being so good to us. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, for your word. Father, for your love and your joy. Help us today to be filled with you 
God, we need your presence in our heart and in our life. And this morning, as a church body, we ask, Lord, fill us up. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. This morning, we've got a little different order for you. We're going to begin this morning because we have a, a special order in leading up to our, our Lord's Supper. I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit, so we're going to start right in on the message this morning and then the singing, and I hope and pray that your hearts will join right in. Did you know that on this day in history, it's called what? Anybody know? Palm Sunday. And that's when the people uh, came together and they cried out to Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna. Well, folks, in the closing weeks of Jesus' ministry, when he was moving around Galilee and, and then headed back up towards Jerusalem, the Scripture says that in that week that multitudes came to Jesus. How, how many is a multitude? Uh, you know, it's kind of like us Texans. We've got all kinds of words for, for a bunch. Uh, you know, we, we say, man, it, it was a gob of folks there. Well, folks, there was a gob of folks there. It said multitudes. And the Scripture says that when Jesus came to them and that when the people came to him, that he spoke and that he taught with authority. Not like the other teachers that were there who would just you know, kind of ramble on and, and say a little bit about old-time Scripture. But he taught with authority and with passion so that their hearts were moved. And not only that, but the Scripture says that he healed people. All day long he healed them. So folks were being drawn to Jesus. Listen, if all of a sudden you knew that somebody came into the area and they said, listen, people are being healed by this man, wouldn't you grab your, your loved one? Your mama, your daddy, your child, your aunt, your uncle, and say, listen, he's here, the healer. Wouldn't you grab him and, and get anywhere you could to try to find Jesus for them to be healed? Would you do that? Do you love him? Do you care? Of course you would. As they began to make their way back towards Jerusalem, the Scripture changed, and it didn't say that a multitude followed him anymore. It then said a great multitude. Listen, if multitude is a bunch, a great multitude is much, much more. In Matthew chapter 19, the scripture says, multitudes followed him into Judea. And it says that Jesus healed them there. Listen to this. Jesus healed them there. Multitudes, great multitudes. And Jesus healed them there. I don't know how many people, but the Scripture says that from the beginning of the day until the close at night, Jesus healed people. He healed person after person after, after person. Jesus was a popular man during this time, don't you think? Sure he was. He was a popular man. Authoritative teaching, healing people by the hundreds, possibly even the thousands. I want you to listen. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? I want you to listen. You, you, you understand that Jesus has been teaching. He's been drawing the great multitudes. And it says, Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you anything about taking these animals, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their clothes out on them. And they set him, Jesus, on the donkey. And a very great multitude. Do you see the progression here? First we had a multitude. Then we had a what? A great multitude. Now we've got a what? Very great multitude. And a very great multitude spread their clothes out on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. 
Then the multitudes who went before, and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Have his praise rising in this place. Here we go. Oh, praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. He is our hope. Why, church? Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. Because in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Come save us. That's a good prayer, amen? That's a prayer we all need. God, come and save us. God, here we are. We need you. The people cried there, Hosanna. That's what Palm Sunday is remembered for. 
people lining the streets, throwing their clothes out so that Jesus doesn't have to ride across on a dusty street, throwing out palm branches. Hosanna! But you know, that crowd was a fickle crowd. They're just like us. Excited one moment about Jesus coming, and then things just turn, and their hearts are changed. The people cried out, Hosanna. But folks, you've got to remember that during that week, as they came in on that Sunday, that was their first day of the week, leading up into the week that we call Passion Week. And Jesus began teaching through that week. He began sharing with the disciples. Now, there were others who listened because there were throngs of people there. And as Jesus taught, he was teaching more specifically to the disciples. And you may even recall that Jesus was teaching in a lot of parables. And then he would pull the disciples off, do you remember? And he would explain what the parables meant. But this span from Palm Sunday to Thursday evening, which was actually Friday, by the way, because you, do you remember that in the Jewish tradition, in the Hebraic tradition, that the day began when? At the evening. At the evening time. And remember in Genesis it says, and the Lord created, and the Lord created, and the evening and the next day was one day. So the day began at sundown. So literally, as we come into this time from Palm Sunday to sundown on Thursday evening or Friday at the beginning of the day, if you have a red letter edition and you go back and you look at all the Gospels, you'll notice that almost all the words are written in red that the recordings there from Palm Sunday to the evening before Jesus was arrested were all about Jesus' teaching. He was preparing his disciples for his departure and for his death. And as he taught, he was speaking authoritatively. He was speaking with passion. He was talking about God's Word. And as he did, he wasn't making friends with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders because he was overturning their authority and turning people's attention back to the authority of God. Stop looking at all these rules and regulations, he was saying. Stop looking at the way that the religious leaders are twisting things and look to what God wants you to do. Jesus taught with such authority that he exposed their hypocrisy. And for that reason, because all the people were thronging to Jesus, multitudes, great multitudes, and then very great multitudes coming to Jesus, these church leaders were jealous and angry because Jesus taught like they never had. So they sought all the more to kill Jesus. Now, Jesus, knowing that his time was near, knowing that this was his last week, that he was going to be alive in the body with his disciples. He drew all 12 of his disciples together, all 12. And he said, we're going to have a time together. And it was the week of Passover. That's why so many people were in Jerusalem. They all came to celebrate the Passover. And Jesus pulled his guys together. And as we read earlier, it says that he, he called a couple of them and he said, what? He said, go and prepare a place for us to have the Passover. They called it Passover. You know what we call it? The Lord's Supper. Where they celebrated the Passover, we call it the Last Supper. You may recall that on that night that Jesus told the twelve. I love a little dramatic music. <laughs> you may recall that on that night, Jesus told his 12. He said, my body's going to be broken. Do you remember? He said, this body's going to be broken for you. My blood is going to be spilled for you so that their sins could be forgiven. You remember that. But they still didn't understand what was coming, did they? 
They didn't understand what, what Jesus was trying to do. Following that Last Supper, that where they re, were together and had communion together, Jesus then took the 11 disciples that were left. Judas left, remember? He said, am I the one to betray you? And Jesus said, you said it. So he said, you go and do whatever you do. You go do quickly. So Judas left and went to go betray Jesus to the church leaders. So Jesus took the 11 other disciples, and they went to a place called Gethsemane. If you've ever been to Israel, right there across from the hill from the city, there is olive groves and gardens, a place where they believe it was, it was, uh, was the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus said, I want you to go with me. I want you to pray with me. Now, why would Jesus stop and pray? Because he knew that his time of suffering was coming. And so he agonized over that, that time. And he asked his friends, his closest people, he said, pray with me. Pray with me and watch with me. Well, you know the disciples didn't do well. They fell asleep. You know what happened then. Matthew chapter 26, verse 47 says, Yet another multitude came. Yet another multitude came with the elders of the church and the chief priests and Judas. And it was a great multitude, the Scripture says. And they came to arrest Jesus. I always kind of thought that maybe it was a small group of just soldiers and the, uh, you know, the, the chief priests. But the Scripture says a multitude of people came. Those religious leaders had the people stirred up. And they came to arrest Jesus. And you've heard about the mock trial that they had. They had no authority to execute Jesus, so they brought him to Pilate. The Scripture says in Matthew chapter 27, it says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 15 and following, it says, Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release into the multitudes one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas, Barabbas or this Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, now who is they? The great multitude that was there. And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, what then shall we do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. So now they had the authority to crucify Jesus. And all the people answered and said, This is scary, folks. His blood be on us on our children. Oh, that's what we want in redemption, but not in the way that they had here. Much of that same crowd that cried, Hosanna! Hosanna to the King! Now cried out and said, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! The Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, they all called for his death. Listen, friends, you be careful with whom you associate. Even your religious leaders, be sure that your religious leaders would be leading you to God and not to crucify him. Listen to Matthew chapter 27, those following verses. Verse 27 and following says, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him 
and they put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand looking like a scepter. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they spat on him. And they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his own clothes back on him, and led him away to be crucified.
Hosanna. Hosanna to the king to crucify. Mm. We can be a very fickle people, amen? Hosanna, crucify. The next time we hear from the crowd, they are mocking him on the cross. Matthew chapter 27, verse 38 and following says, Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from that cross. That must have been hard for a true king to take. Amen? If you are the Son of God. Scripture says that likewise the chief priests also mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others himself. He cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Friends, Jesus himself literally could have called heaven against those men. He could have called. Do you remember, if you want to go back and look at Matthew chapter 26, do you remember in the garden before Jesus was arrested? The men came in and the crowd came in and, and it says that uh, there was a, uh, a complement of Roman soldiers there and they came to arrest him. And what did Peter do? Do you remember? Peter took out his sword and he cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. And Jesus told him, he said, put away your sword. He said, do you not know? Let me just read for you Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. He says, do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? He says, don't fight. Do you know how many a legion is? Anybody? 6,000. Minimum. Actually, the, the uh, definition is at least 6,000 soldiers or more to make a legion. Scripture tells us that he could have called heaven. Listen, Jesus had only but to speak the word and say, destroy, and everyone on this earth would have been obliterated just like that. How do we know this? Because he created us the same way. He spoke us into being. <laughs> and yet, he reminds us there in Matthew chapter 26, he said, Peter, don't you know that if I called out, the Father would send 12 legions of angels? But he said, it must be so. It's got to be like this. I have to do this for your sake, for the sake of the world. He said, without me doing this, there won't be a salvation. John chapter 19 tells us that Mary, Jesus' mother, was there. She was watching. John had her beside him, and Jesus called out to John and said, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. He was saying, you take care of each other. And when the sin of the world was laid on Jesus, his mother had to watch. Mark chapter 15, verse 33 says, Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Verse 34 tells us that the absence of his father, because the father turned his, his head away from Christ, as the sin of the world came down on his son, God had to look away. He couldn't look at the filth that fell on his precious son. So he turned his face away, and the light of the world left. 
Jesus on the cross received every sin that you have ever committed or ever will commit. Every sin that I have ever committed. Every sin in this world was put on Jesus. And Jesus cried out in anguish when the Father turned away and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken? Great God, I come before you overwhelmed with grief. My son, your son hangs on a cross designed for criminals. He is bleeding and I can see the pain in his eyes. keep remembering Gabriel's visit. Elizabeth's affirmation, Joseph's kindness. I was so amazed to be chosen as the mother of the Messiah. I remember watching him learn to walk to play with other children. He was always so kind. A careful carpenter. A devoted son. Especially to you. I remember when he left on his ministry, I would, I would stand in amazement as I watched him heal the sick and and gather children to tell them of your love. People came from far and near and I, I, just last week, great crowds thronged about him, screaming, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I thought they understood who he was. And now this. This crowd that clung to him for healing and they scream for his blood. Do they not understand that he is innocent? That he has done nothing but come to help them. This crowd, this crowd that pushed me to the front as I watched my son endure a Roman whip. the little boy who clung to me and I could not protect him. I watched as he collapsed under the weight of his own cross. His, his hands hands that healed the sick and touched the lame are bound with ropes and pierced with nails. His, his feet that led him to the lost and the lame are cut and shackled. 
His head. The head that I kissed goodnight is torn and bleeding. No one ridicules the thieves! But they scream at my gentle son! My son! Oh, great God, I fall before you! Are you not his father as I am his mother? Do you not weep for him as I do? Why would you send him to us to take him like this? I hear him cry out to you not to leave him. But he said you were one. I do not understand. He needs you now more than ever. Are you there? Have you abandoned us? Yahweh! Yahweh, where are you? Yahweh! And yet, my heart stirs. And I know you are with him. And I know you will bring good out of this terrible evil, although I do not understand. God, no. No. Does he do this for me? Yahweh, no. Does my son, does he suffer for me? My sin is so great. I cannot bear to think of it, and yet he takes it willingly. The prophecies, all those years ago, spoken to my mind. Now they pierce my heart. He does this out of love for me. Out of love for them. So you cannot ease his pain. And he chooses not to save himself. He does this, that he is not my son, so that he is my savior. <laughs> so great God, I give you my grief, and I give you my son.
And I hear you say, this is my beloved son who takes away the sin of the world. And so in my grief, I will praise your name. begin to relate when we come to a place of understanding that he's not just Jesus he's God's son and that God's son died on a cross to be your savior Romans 6.23 tells us that the payment for our sin is death. That our sin separates us from God. That we stand on one side and that a great gulf stands between us and God and it's called our sin. And that gulf cannot be surpassed by us. Our sin separates us from God. When we sin, we incur a legal debt. Listen to me. When we sin, we incur a legal debt to God, and we deserve to be punished. And there's nothing that we can do in our flesh to get back to God. Not good deeds, not having the right religion, not a certain philosophy. But Jesus Christ who was indeed God in the flesh, took upon himself my sin, the sin of us all. And he bore them in his body on the cross so that his cross became a bridge that we might be able to come to God the Father. Jesus suffered and bore our sin. He died on that cross. And that is how sin is paid for, people. That's how sin is paid for. The last words of Jesus Christ on the cross was, it is finished. And the actual word you've heard is tetelestai in the Greek. And it was a marketplace word that was used when a transaction was completed, when someone took their purchase, and they gave them the right amount of money, and it was paid for. The merchant would then say, it is finished. He would say, tetelestai, your debt is paid. And that's exactly what Jesus said on the cross as he hung there. Tetelestai. Our sins put Jesus on the cross. Our sins were nailed to the cross. Through his suffering and through his death, Jesus paid for my sin. Let me ask you, why would God accept any other payment? Do you think that after giving his son in such a manner that he would say, oh, just any way to me is okay? There's no other way except through Jesus You've got to come to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus made the payment. Friends, I want to ask you even now, if you've never come to the place where you've realized the payment that was made for your sin, 
that Jesus Christ died on that cruel cross, not just for the world, but for you. If you've never come to that place, let today be the day. Forgive them, he said, for they know not what they do. Would you bow with me in prayer? Friend, if you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life, if you've never surrendered yourself to him, I want you to understand it is not an easy road. You've got to choose what God calls the narrow gate, Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. God gives us many promises. But one thing he does not promise is time. We don't know when he'll return. We don't know when we'll be taken. Can you say without the shadow of a doubt, friend, listen to my words. Can you say without the shadow of a doubt, without the slightest holdback, I know that if I were to die, I'd go to heaven because I have trusted and put my faith in Jesus Christ, his son. If you've not done that, would you today? I'm going to ask my prayer partners to come. These men, our deacon servants, are going to be here to pray with you, for you. I'll be here. If God has moved your heart to receive him, if you have a decision that needs to be made for the Lord this day, why would you wait? Would you come? You come. Lord Jesus, your son, as he hung on that cross, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, I pray that that has been the prayer of everyone here. And if not, Father, let today be that day where they would say, Lord, I commend my life, my love, my spirit to you. If God moves your heart, your friend, today is the day. Deacons, would you move forward and face out? Receive anyone in prayer who might come. If you need someone to pray with you and pray for you, you come even now, would you? As God leads, you come. And friend, God has moved your heart for the need of rededicating your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Would you prepare right now your heart to receive his remembrance? Ask God for his forgiveness. Ask God to help you to walk with him faithfully and make a commitment to be steadfast in your faith for him. Would you prepare your heart to receive the Lord's Supper even now during this time of invitation? You pray and prepare even as we pray.
we want all to be able to receive who prepared their hearts. If you need a gluten-free bread, we have it. If you need that so that you can partake of this remembrance with us, would you raise a hand? We'll make sure it gets to you. Scripture tells us that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. And when he broke it, he said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. I don't think there's a much more poignant illustration than the crushing of his body with our own personal teeth. It's a personal sin he died for. The body of Christ Jesus was broken for you in remembrance, take and eat.
as we receive the cup. I invite you to stay seated, but would you sing with us? I'm sorry. Twisted. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He would give only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders, a shame hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I that it is finished. I will. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. And why should I gain from his reward, I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my Scripture tells us that after he broke the bread and each had partaken, that Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the cup of a new covenant, an agreement with God that's not to be broken. That's a covenant. He said, this covenant is in my blood spilled for you because without the shedding of blood. There is no 
forgiveness of sin. The blood of Christ Jesus was shed for me. The blood of Christ Jesus was shed for you. Say it with me. Say me. The blood of Christ Jesus was shed for in remembrance of him. Take and drink. Would you stand with me? Scripture says that when they completed the Lord's Supper, that last supper, that they sang a hymn. I think this is very appropriate. Oh, how he loves you and me. Would you put that hymn up on the screen for us, Tanny? I think you all of you know this, but in case you didn't, we're going to get it up there for you in a second here. And as you sing, sing to him. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice, take joy. sweet 